In the 13th century BC, Tutankhamun was crowned Pharaoh of Egypt when he was still no more than a child. The boy grew up to be a living god. Yet this most famous of all pharaohs was to die before his 20th birthday, in circumstances that have never been explained. Now, 3,000 years later, two American detectives have reopened the casebook on his death. They are convinced he was murdered. Following a trail of forgotten clues through the ancient ruins of Egypt, detectives Greg Cooper and Mike King believe they have already found evidence of foul play, manipulation, and an over-hasty burial. To understand the threats to Tut's safety, Cooper and King take to the air, viewing the pharaoh's capital for the first time. Close to the Valley of the Kings are the ruins of Malkata, where Tutankhamun lived. Just how secure was the palace? Separate from the main city, the palace was a secure, self-contained 85-acre complex. Back on the ground, expert witness Joanne Fletcher points out the very rooms where Tut lived. Recent excavations have shown very definitely that the walls surrounding uh, the king's bedchamber in the inner rooms of the royal residence were incredibly thick. And this definitely suggests heightened security about the person of the king when he would have been at his most vulnerable during the night. And so these thick walls would have offered extra protection. And of course, there would have been guards at the door of the royal bedchamber at all times when the king was within. So security would have been incredibly tight. With Tut under constant surveillance, Cooper and King doubt he was killed by an opportunistic killer. The inevitable question looms. Was Tutankhamun's murder an inside job? And in this situation, with a young king, you're generally talking about a, a very low-risk victim. Uh, somebody, therefore, if in fact he was murdered, would have been murdered or conspired against by those who were closest to him. And so you have to take a look at that close circle, identify those people who would have motive, opportunity, and means. Safely ensconced in Malkata Royal Palace, the young king had everything to live for. But before his 20th birthday, he would be dead. Having made peace with his father's adversaries, Tut had no obvious enemies. Perhaps the killer lurked among those closest to Tutankhamun. I, Maya, and Horemheb. Or even closer. As the detectives know, the first suspect in a homicide investigation is usually the spouse. His closest association is going to be his wife. What was that relationship like? What were the dy dynamics like? Were, were they happily married? Were they close? Uh, was there enmity between them? As his elder half-sister, Ankasanamun looked after Tutankhamun since childhood. As his child wife, she joined him on the journey to Thebes. No one was closer to the king.
as his lover, she enjoyed the most access to the pharaoh, giving her means and opportunity. As queen, Ankhesenamun might claim the throne herself upon Tut's death. Cooper and King believe they've uncovered a stronger motive. Not power, but desperation. In 1927, after five years of careful excavation, Howard Carter made a poignant discovery in Tutankhamun's tomb. Two mummified fetuses. The uh, presence of the two fetuses, we're still trying to determine, and hasn't been confirmed yet, as to whether or not there was a bloodline there, a relationship between Tut and those two children. Uh, but I'm not convinced that they weren't. Most experts believe the fetuses belong to Tutankhamun and Ankhesenamun, evidence the young couple was trying to start a family. In 1932, Douglas Derry performed autopsies on the fetuses. Both were girls, one born four months premature, the other stillborn. In 1978, Professor R.G. Harrison performed a second autopsy on the older fetus. He made an unsettling discovery. In 1927, after five years of careful excavation, Howard Carter made a poignant discovery in Tutankhamun's tomb. Two mummified fetuses. In 1978, Professor R.G. Harrison performed a second autopsy on the older fetus. She suffered from spina bifida and scoliosis, both deformities of the spine. Such birth defects could have been inherited from the parents, but until now, no such evidence has been found. It uh, suggests a, a very tight bonding, emotional relationship possibly uh, between King Tut and his children. And the At the request of Cooper and King, pediatric radiologist Richard Boyer examined the x-rays of Tutankhamun. So I'm going to talk about that, and then the other doctors can amplify on that. Let's turn away now from the skull, but stay... stay he found groundbreaking evidence that links Tutankhamun to the fetuses. His findings change the detective's perception of their victim and provide a motive for murder. These vertebral bodies are fused together, okay? And that's not a normal finding. This is a young man. He should have a nice, healthy-looking cervical spine. And this is not a nice, healthy-looking cervical spine. Boyer believes Tutankhamun suffered a congenital abnormality of the spine called Klippelfile syndrome. A normal spine is flexible, enabling us to turn our head from left to right and up and down. Klippelfile is a crippling disease that severely restricts movement. For a Klippelfile sufferer to simply turn his head, he must move his whole upper body. The disease left Tut extremely vulnerable. His head is like it's on a broomstick or a poker, so that he fell backward or there were a blow to, to somewhere in the back of his head. He could very easily have injured his spinal cord at that level, and a serious spinal cord injury at that level may not be compatible with life. Evidence found in the tomb supports the Klippelfile diagnosis. Howard Carter uncovered 130 walking sticks. Unlike the ceremonial walking sticks of other pharaohs, many of Tutankhamun's were clearly used, starting when he was a small child. Still more proof. An ancient portrait shows Tutankhamun leaning on a staff, his feet twisted beneath him. Boyer's examination of the chest x-rays revealed a final piece of evidence no one else had noticed before. An abnormal curvature of the spine, scoliosis. A spinal defect, often found in victims of Klippelfile, 
Scoliosis also afflicted one of the infants found in Tut's tomb. The evidence convinces the detectives the fetuses are Tut's. Re-enter his wife, Ankasanamu, heartbroken by two miscarriages. Her husband never gave her a child. For the dynasty to survive, she would have to look elsewhere. The detectives suspect her not of adultery, but murder. In regard to Anka Sanaman, could she have placed the blame of, of the early miscarriages of her children on her husband and perhaps his inability to, to seed healthy children who could be carried to full term? Could she have a desire to get a different husband so that she could sire children? Anka Sanamun, a murderess, an expert witness disagrees. He believes pictorial evidence exonerates the queen. If you look at the throne, the seat of King Tut, you'll find out that she's leaning on him. She's looking at him with love. The scenes, the relationship, the touch. You never see this touch before. It shows the king and the queen standing. She's putting her hand in her shoulder. She's putting a flower on his mummy. This is a sign of love. Another expert believes Anka Sanamun is guiltless. The psychological profile Dr. Burstein created refutes any role in her husband's death. It's likely that she would have done her best to remove the blindfold, to allow Tot, at least figuratively, if not literally, to watch his back. King Tut's wife, I think, clearly in the beginning was one that we questioned. But I think as we investigated the case, as we look at the apparent uh, love that existed between her and the young king, it's easy to exclude her and then begin to focus on the more probable suspects, Maya, on I and Horemheb. For almost a decade, I, Maya, and Horemheb had run the country in the pharaoh's name. They had developed a taste for power. When you have a situation of a young king who's really a titular, a nominal leader, the bearer of the line, but not the person making the decisions, who's coming of age, obviously it's a crucial moment. Will those who have benefited from the king now lose their power? Will there be changes? It's obviously a time when at least it enters the mind of people do we kill the king? Do we allow him to become the real king rather than the nominal king? I, Maya, and Horemheb each had a lot to lose if Tutankhamun assumed power himself. But which man gained most by Tut's death? The, the, probably the most important thing to do is to lay all of those suspects out in front of us as possibilities and start to look at the different reasons why they might be suspect in that case. Look at the different forms of motivation uh, that they might have for committing this crime. Look at the ways in which they might gain as a result of committing that crime. As chief finance minister, Maya held the country's purse strings, in the process, becoming a wealthy man. An obsessive guardian of the treasury, he rescued Egypt's economy from the financial ruin caused by Tutankhamun's father. What if the young king threatened to undo all of Maya's work? Suppose Tutankhamun showed signs of his father's self-obsession and disregard for Egypt's economy. There are financial problems in the country, and I'm sure that's created a huge amount of stress, not only in the administration, 
but among the people who are probably facing taxation problems and other kinds of things. To safeguard Egypt's riches and his own, could Maya have killed his king? Shortly after Tutankhamun was buried, his tomb was robbed. Who lovingly restored it, then carefully resealed it? Maya. Maya was one of the few who knew where Tutankhamun was buried. To safeguard the pharaoh's afterlife, Maya destroyed all records of the tomb's location. After Tutankhamun's death, Maya continued to work in the royal court. All the evidence suggests he remained steadfast to the dead king. In the beginning, I immediately thought of Maya, who was in a country troubled by finances, and, uh, and yet when I saw some of the tender things that Maya did and the things to ensure his leader's progression into the hereafter, it was, I think, easy for me to, to exclude Maya as a suspect. Cooper and King scratch Maya from the list of suspects. Resuming their investigation, Cooper and King turn to the commander-in-chief of Tut's army. A self-made man, the ambitious Horemheb, becomes their next suspect. Behind the boasts of a warrior, Cooper and King seek the mark of a killer. Horemheb rose through the ranks during the reign of Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten. Under Tut, he became commander-in-chief of the most powerful army in the known world. What would have been his level of power and influence throughout the community? I think he would have had immense power and influence, possibly second <laughs> only to the king, because he had the army. He controlled the army. He could have... Um, you know, undertaking a coup, a military coup, and taking over Egypt. Egypt's enemies were gathering. A new menace rose in the north, the Hittites. What better time to attack Egypt than when an untested boy took the throne? Horemheb would have seen the threat. A fierce patriot, he's likely to have done anything for the country he loved. With motive established, the detectives look for evidence. We can also see... Is there a forensic clue to link Horemheb with Tut's murder? The detectives are intrigued by a revelation from the first autopsy on Tut. Douglas Derry found evidence the body might have been damp while being wrapped. Yet the very purpose of mummification is to dry out the corpse. What went wrong in Tutankhamun's case? His degree of preservation is not as good as other uh, mummies, isn't even as good as w the fetuses that were in the tomb with him. You certainly wouldn't expect that he's going to get a less than competent team working on his embalming. Uh, given his social position, he's going to get the best they have. and. What that raises in my mind is the possibility that he was decomposing to some degree before they managed to get him to the embalmers and start working on trying to retard and stop that process. If Tut's corpse was decomposing by the time it was mummified, it answers a question that's long puzzled an expert witness. Why Tut's mummy was covered in an unusually large amount of scented resins called unguents? According to Carter, there were two, at least two bucketfuls poured over, no, of unguents poured over the mummy, and another two bucketfuls over the coffin. Now, why in all the world would one do that? If you have seen the decomposing bodies, which I have as a result of the war, 
there is a terrible odor. So not only can you not mummify a decomposing body, but the body also smells. So it is quite possible that they use this tremendous amount of unguents, the unusual amount of unguents, in order to mask the smell. But why would the pharaoh's body be allowed to decompose? And what connected Horemheb with his murder? A clue lay in Tutankhamun's tomb. Howard Carter discovered no fewer than six chariots. Three were purely ceremonial, but two were for hunting. Despite his disability, Tutankhamun was clearly an avid charioteer. Perhaps he died in an accident far from home. Professor Rodine envisions a likely scenario. Let us assume uh, that uh, he was hunting, uh, let us assume he was fishing. Uh, all these scenes are described uh, in the books and in his funerary equipment. And uh, uh, there was an accident. It may take some time uh, until the group uh, that he is with uh, can uh, get to him and then transport him back to the uh, house uh, of the embalmers. Under those circumstances, it does not take very long in the heat of the Egyptian sun for the body to start to decompose. Anybody who has been to Egypt knows that the flies are abundant. And if you have a body that cannot move and the flies, they will settle. And therefore you will get maggots and under those circumstances it becomes impossible for practical purposes to desiccate a body properly. And that may have been the problem that the embalmers were confronted with. Cooper and King think it unlikely Tutankhamun died in an accident. Someone was always looking out for him. But suppose the man charged with that job had other intentions. Someone like the master charioteer and commander in chief Horemheb. The general could have exploited a private ride with the king. The scenario provides opportunity and means, but what about motive? The detectives doubt a patriot like Horemheb would commit murder purely out of ambition. But what other reason might he have had? Was it Tutankhamun's Achilles heel, the disability called clipophile that fused the pharaoh's spine? Victims of clipophile often suffer from a host of other symptoms, including partial deafness, cleft palate, and kidney problems. In Tut's day, physical infirmity was scorned as the detective's legal expert reveals. In those days, physical weakness was often associated with moral weakness as well. And we know there was a history of killing the disabled. Uh, a disabled king could be seen uh, both as an opportunity to kill and as an excuse. And uh, the disability could easily be blamed as a contributing factor to the death. So the disability certainly is a relevant clue in trying to figure out what might have happened. Despite his disability, Tutankhamun was clearly an avid charioteer. Perhaps he died in an accident far from home. Afflicted by Klippelfile, a slight blow to the back of the head would have proved fatal. If he topples off of some form of conveyance, like his chariot, again, this kind of impact on the back of his head could quite easily explain a lethal injury because of his rigidity and all of the force going right through that um, junction between the base of the skull and the spine.
the perfect murder, disguised as an accident in a faraway place. Horemheb had means, motive, and opportunity. Even the circumstantial evidence is damning. Horemheb was to become Pharaoh after Tut's death, but not as soon as he had hoped. Perhaps the detectives have their man. Or do they? Compelling as the case against Horemheb seems, two expert witnesses find grounds for reasonable doubt. One might think, for example, that the military is more likely to incline to acts of violence. On the other hand, the military is often more loyal uh, to the king. Harum had, had no great love for Tutankhamun. This kid's deformed, he's weak, he's easily manipulated. Having said that, he would have had even less love for any changes or transitions, because any transition which destabilized Egypt would have meant that resources would have been diverted from the army and the army's major job. It's not likely that he would have focused on how do I get rid of this new king, King Tut. In death, as in life, Horemheb remains a formidable foe, hard to outflank or pin down. The detectives suspend judgment till they've examined their final suspect. It is far more likely that someone who is closer to Tut, as I was, someone who directly profited from Tut's death, as I did, would have been his murderer. Could the father figure in Tut's life be the man behind his death? As the detectives begin tracking their last suspect, the face of their victim is finally coming into focus. From the young pharaoh's x-rays, the contours of his skull were mapped. Similar skin types were scanned and averaged to put flesh on bone. Now, the first virtual face of Tutankhamun appears. One more step remains. Tot's virtual face is being sculpted as a life-size model in clay. Soon, the detectives will see the face of the victim whose murder they're trying to solve. But will the face of Tutankhamun resemble the famous death mask? Back in Egypt, Cooper and King search for clues about Tutankhamun's prime minister, I, the last man in their lineup of suspects. Upon the death of Tut's father, I became the boy king's protector. Why would someone who was a surrogate father in some sense turn around and destroy his own creation? Being Tut's protector had given I a taste of power. I was probably a great politician and public relations man for whoever he worked for. I see him as someone who probably was very manipulative, but I also think that I was a conniving man personally. Just how conniving I may have been is revealed in the tomb he built in Amarna, but never used. He abandoned it when the capital was moved back to Thebes. Cooper and King discover an opportunist who changed his beliefs with the ease of a chameleon. I think it's incredible that I was building a tomb that paid such great homage to the Aten when in fact he was so closely in aligned with the Amun priests. 
And uh, as we know of politics today, it appears that uh, he was more than willing to allow himself to be influenced and go with whatever the strongest stream was at the time. The paintings in Ai's tomb provide evidence that incriminates him. It appears that with that willingness to make such contrasts and such incredible changes in uh, his approach to the religious system, uh, that maybe he was mostly devoted to himself. By the time I was living in Thebes with the young Tut installed as pharaoh, the prime minister had changed sides once again. Rejecting the Aten worship of Akhenaten, he turned back to the former state god Amun. If I proved so disloyal after the death of Tut's father, how did he behave after the death of Tut himself? For the detectives, the events after a murder matter as much as those before. In the case of the murder of King Tut, these events take place not in Egypt, but foreign lands. Eight hundred miles north of Thebes lies the capital of the Hittite Empire, sworn enemy of Egypt. Two messengers carry a letter from an Egyptian queen. Discovered in Turkey a century ago, the letter paints a portrait of a desperate woman. Experts believed she was Ankasanamu. I am afraid. My husband died, a son I have not. But to thee, they say, the sons are many. If thou wilt give me a son of thine, he would become my husband. Why would Tutankhamun's widow do the unthinkable and appeal to Egypt's oldest enemy for a husband? This is unusual for an Egyptian queen, and even an Egyptian lady from the common people, to marry someone who's not an Egyptian. An Egyptian man can marry a foreign girl, but an Egyptian lady will never marry a foreign man. She reaches out as far away as she can to a traditional enemy. What does this tell us? Why would a, a loyal queen, in a sense, almost commit treason to go outside for companionship and to have children. So she clearly wanted to have children and was willing to go outside of the monarchy and any of her close associates. She felt very, very compelled to do so. That causes a great deal of suspicion. With no children to inherit his throne, Tutankhamun's rightful heir could well have been Ankasanamu. History has shown that females have also served as pharaohs. In regard to Anka Sanaman, uh, she had the ability, in reality, to become a pharaoh herself. Yet the queen of Egypt is a frightened widow. Suspecting a trap, the Hittite king declines to send a son, prompting her to send an even more desperate appeal. Had I a son, would I have written about my own and my country's shame to a foreign land? She closes with a cry from the heart. Never shall I take a servant of mine and make him my husband. Which of Tut's servants would gain most from marrying his widow? Cooper and King believe the answer lies in the Valley of the Kings, in the grave of Tutankhamun himself. The smoking gun to the homicide investigation of King Tut is going to be found in the behavior that we see on the walls in the tombs. At last, the detectives believe they hold the clues to decode the tomb. Egyptian wall paintings were meant to be viewed by the gods on Judgment Day. When dead men tell tales, they mustn't tell lies. As they return to the tomb, Cooper and King find what they're looking for. A vital moment in Tutankhamun's death is depicted on the south wall. 
Look at this, the opening of the mouth ceremony that we've read about and, and learned about. During the ceremony, the soul of the deceased is reborn. For a pharaoh, the ceremony was performed by the heir to the throne. Performing it for Tutankhamun is I. I is not supposed to be a king. Uh, by the Egyptian order that he cannot be a king, he's not from the royal blood, he's only a priest. A telltale clue explains how I could perform the ritual, how he could be the servant Ankasa Namu wrote of with such dread. In 1931, a ring inscribed with the names of Ankasa Namun and I turned up in an Egyptian antique shop. The detectives think I forced Ankasa Namun into marriage, his only route to the throne. Through that union, I think I saw that as a political legitimization of his uh, rule. In the eyes of the Egyptian, they would consider him the king because he's married the wife of, the, of, the, of, of King Tut. Cooper and King tighten the noose on the killer. They have one last clue to investigate, the tomb Tutankhamun planned to be buried in. The interesting thing is that uh, Tut was planning to be buried in the same location of his grandfather. And don't you find it peculiar that his wishes were not adhered to? That in fact it was I that was buried in his tomb. No structure was more precious to a pharaoh than the tomb where he would spend eternity. Tut fell victim to the worst kind of grave robbing. His very tomb was stolen. The thief, none other than his successor, I. The detectives are about to enter the lair of their prime suspect. Smells like a ladder. And come face to face with the victim himself. The quest for Tutankhamun's killer nears an end. Amazing. The beast. Detectives Cooper and King think they have their man. Attack. Fatally, Tutankhamun placed his trust in the one man with the most to gain from his death. The detective's criminal profiler believes the psychological evidence points to I. The three elements which come together to point to I being the murderer are that I had the motive wishing to maintain power. He had the opportunity. He was so close to Tut. And he had the means, he had the power in the court to be able to put his plans into action. With all the evidence in, Cooper and King agree. I think uh, I felt that he deserved the throne. I'm the one that's responsible for bringing things back to order. It's really not King Tut. He's he nothing but a boy. Now, how could a boy figure this kind of a strategy out? He determined for one reason or another that it was his turn. Uh, he deserved it and uh, he was going to take it. As an intimate of the Pharaoh, I knew that Tutankhamun's infirmities left him vulnerable. It's a reasonable inference that Tutankhamun was murdered and that he was murdered by I. The list of victims doesn't stop with Tut. We don't know what happened to Ankasanam. Why? 
Did she know something that the rest of us don't? From what we know about I, he's not above forcing King Tut's wife into marrying him. And then, lo and behold, she disappears from history as much as Tut is expunged from history. It's likely that she was murdered by him once she served to legitimize his own power. In the tomb stolen from Tutankhamun, Cooper and King seek signs of a killer's remorse. Look at this incredible hunting scene. I wonder if that's consistent with other pharaohs. On the walls, they find a picture out of place, a hunting scene. Unique amongst all royal tombs, you have a king shown hunting in his tomb. And this is a motif, the hunting motif, that is only ever found in non-royal tombs. So does this suggest to you, perhaps, was I maybe unsure of his position? The hunting scene, being the mark of a commoner, leads Cooper and King to believe that I was finally confessing to the gods he had become pharaoh by an unlawful act. A last piece of evidence that I was the murderer. In the tomb stolen from Tutankhamun, Cooper and King seek signs of a killer's remorse. The hunting scene, being the mark of a commoner, leads Cooper and King to believe that I was finally confessing to the gods he had become pharaoh by an unlawful act. A last piece of evidence that I was the murderer. I's reign was short-lived. An old man, when he took the throne, he ruled just four years. Yet the story doesn't end there. He was succeeded by the man who still led the army, Horemheb. Horemheb and his successors erased all traces of Ai from history, ensuring his name never joined the list of pharaohs at the Temple of Abydos. In the process, they helped Ai get away with murder. In the 27 years of his reign, Horemheb embarked on a major restoration of ancient traditions. Like I, Tutankhamun and his heretic father were purged from history, as if they had never reigned. Their names are also missing from the list at Abydos. Egypt was making a fresh start. Innocent revisionism, or cold-blooded cover-up. Some speculate I had a partner in crime, Horemheb. For the detectives, the general's role must remain a matter of conjecture. With old-fashioned detective work and modern forensics, Cooper and King have reached back in time to right a wrong and nail a killer. All that remains is Chief Cooper and Detective King to at last see the face of the victim. This is really exciting. Back home in the US, the detectives receive a long-awaited package. Well, here we go. be launched into the eternities. Look at that. So this is the real life model of the 3D face that Dr. Richards made. Hold the profile to that to the side. The moment is unnerving. It's the first opportunity to really personalize it. This is probably the best way to end an investigation like this, to finally meet the victim. After months on the trail of Tut's killer, Cooper and King gaze on their victim. They've lifted the mask. The real Tutankhamun is not the smiling king idealized in ancient paintings, but a human and frail young man. Upon his face are etched the worries of empire, 
and the burdens of a disability he probably tried to hide. It's the likeness of a face as it might truly look, not as others wish it to seem. Like the reality behind the mask, the truth about the boy king's life, as revealed by Cooper and King, is far different from the story history records. Manipulated from the day he was crowned, transplanted to a strange city with his child bride, victim of forces greater than himself. Yet when the puppet tried to cut his strings, he was cruelly cut down, murdered by the man he thought of as a father. Once Egypt's most obscure king, Tutankhamun is now more famed than the pharaoh who took his life, or the one who erased his legacy. The man who found his tomb gave Tutankhamun the gift of fame. The men who found his killer gave him the gift of justice. Perhaps now he can rest in peace in the Valley of the Kings.